Hello and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari, and this is Great Big History Podcast. In this episode, we start with settled people and the creation of cities in Mesopotamia. So, settled people. Settled people in early Mesopotamia are us. They are the forefathers of the world. Most people today are not hunter-gatherers. 99 point whatever percentage of it is. Urbanization has won. Settled people have won. So we have to talk about that. In fact, basically every civilization we're going to talk about from here on in is in some way, shape, or form settled. They are going to stay in the same place, grow their own food. Even if they conquer other people, they go somewhere else and they beat up other people, they will still have more or less a homeland that they call theirs and that they continue to grow food on. So rather than hunt and gather food, settled people grow it. And so why settle? And the answer is the huge advantages that end up happening. That's why you settle. I had a student today who came up and, and asked and said, like, preference. Well, this might be a stupid question. Um, I know we're talking about nomads, but, uh, and I'm like, no, there are no stupid questions. If you have a question, why that's history. And she goes, well, why didn't they just grow their own food? And I'm like, that's what we're going to talk about because very few people, there is a transition throughout this course from nomadic people to settled people and settled people start very small in a few little cities in one part of earth and they spread and they spread and they spread and the idea picks up in other places and so what are the advantages why do people start um, growing food and why doesn't everybody just grow food? Well, the reason why you just everybody doesn't grow food is it's too hard. It is so hard. And we'll get to that in a moment. That's our disadvantages. So let's start with our advantages. The advantages are a huge, massive increase in food. Like, look at today. Look at right now in our lives. 2% of Americans are farmers. 2%. And they produce much more food than America can consume. They export most of their food to the world. America is one of the largest exporters of food in the world. We make way more than we can consume. That's 2% of the population. Now, throughout all of history, up until industrialization, it's basically 98%. And then it starts to go down in the late, about 1750s, it starts to go down to... To, and maybe a little bit earlier than that, but when we're talking about my Swedes in the sixteen, in the in the sixteen fifties, we're talking ninety percent of the people were farmers, so it hadn't gone down that much by the sixteen hundreds. Um, there's a crash with industrialization because machines could do much more work than humans could, but you get much more food than you could find or you could pick. Um, so. That book that's out there that's like, what did we give up for civilization? Oh, living in cities is the worst thing we ever did. No, living in cities is the greatest thing we ever did. Agriculture is the best thing that ever happened to people because they stopped starving. Now, he makes some argument that people didn't starve, but that's why your nomads go from place to place to place killing people. Like, he forgets that whole part. And it's not like, oh, you don't have evidence. Well, of course I don't have evidence. Nobody wrote anything down. But I have the Mongols. I've got the Huns. I've got nomadic horse lords in the Great Plains who, uh, who beat up uh, people who didn't have horses. Like, we've got plenty of modern nomadic peoples from the Middle Ages, from the Huns on that enter. And we have the Persians, for God's sakes who enter into civilized society and have wrecked the place, wreck other people. They go looking for food. Nomadic life is hard and you're always one bad disaster from either being obliterated by other peoples or starvation. 
settling down agriculture solves that problem. You have food stability. I know. You ask a farmer, you ask any farmer, any professional farmer, how much yield, how many plants, how much grain, how much, not grain, how many, how much pounds, how many tons will you get? And they'll have one question for you. Which crop? Corn. They'll know because they know how much acreage they have. They know how much they've planted. So they know what to expect. They know what they should get. So you have food stability. You can look at a 10 acre farm and you know you are going to produce enough to eat. Um, it's an interesting thing. Humans by themselves with the strength of their back by themselves can farm around 15 acres of land in a year. So guess, here's the funny thing. Guess what the average size of a farm was? It's about 15 acres. Guess how much acreage you needed to feed a family and have a little bit left over for income. Turns out to be about 15 acres. How weird is that? That the strength of a human corresponds to pretty much the limit of human endurance in agriculture for what we call subsistence farming, just enough to get by and have a little extra little savings. Now, if you gain, gain animals, oxen later on horses, you can, you can do more than 15 acres, but you remember a, f a farm in the ancient world has to be about 15 acres to feed a family. So that's all people want. People want 15 acres, 15 acres and a mule, 15 acres and an ox. Well, then you could get more 25 acres because the ox has to eat, but you need 15 acres and you have enough to feed yourself and be independent. So you get individual and generational wealth. You can leave that land behind. You now have your own income. Like nomads don't have money or wealth of any sort. They have to share everything because when they hunt, when they kill something, they have to bring it back and everyone shares it. When they gather, you, you share it with everybody. My 15 acres is my food. And if it's more than I need, I can sell the rest or save it and boom, I make some money. I now have individual wealth. Now I will die one day. And so I leave it to my children and that's generational wealth. Generation after generation after generation can build on that wealth. So my sons buy land next to mine. They know they're going to have my 15 acres so they can get loans from the bank uh, based on my 15 acres. And if they make out, they buy the land next to it. Now they got 30 acres and they buy more land. It's 45 acres. And now they combine now they combine that. And now you have 45 acres of land instead of 15 acres. And that's generational wealth. So for the first time, people start getting actually wealthier both in their lifetimes and over generations, they start to actually have individual wealth, which leads them to independence. Suddenly they have wealth and they don't need other people. They say, I can do it on my own. I don't need you. I don't need your food. I got my own food. And so you get the concept of independence of, I can do this on my own. Now we're not talking American independence. We're not talking, I am on my own. I don't need anybody. There's still, we're going to talk about religion. You're still tied to a very large group of people, but you're not as dependent or interdependent as you were in the nomads. Nomads are communists. Nomads share everything. There is no one who's individually anything in nomadic society. It is for, it is the pure Marx, where the idea, the, uh, it's not Marx, but somebody else who is, who is philosophizing on Marx, who said it's um, Marxism is um, from whom what one can give and to whom what one needs. It's the idea that you only need so much stuff, so the society will give it to you, and you give to the society what you can give. If you're a great musician, you give music. If you've got a strong back, you give your strength of your back. You're a warrior. If you uh, tame horses, you're a horse tamer. 
And but the idea is no matter what you do, you shouldn't be punished for it. You shouldn't have less than you need. And likewise, you shouldn't have more than you need. Like, who needs $30 million? The answer is nobody. Absolutely nobody. You don't need it. It is way... And you're like, well, well, what if I want to buy a $10 million house? Well, if you didn't have $30 million, people with $30 million hoarding $30 million, would you have a $10 million house? No. And so the idea is, but you don't need a $10 million house. You need a house. People do fine with $10,000 trailers all the way up. So you don't need, and the, and the emphasis is need, from what, from whom what one can give. So where your talents lie, and to whom what one needs. Food, clothing, shelter, a job of importance, respect. Those kinds of things. That's nomadic society. Settled society, on the other hand, is what I create. Me. We start to get eyes. I. Where in nomadic society, there is no I. There's we and us. And, you know, in settled societies, we start to get I. I produce this. It's my farm. I own this. So you get independence. Now, that's good. Like, we value independence as an American. So we start to get this. What's the disadvantages? Well, the first is farmers don't farmers farm, man. They don't fight. Farmers don't fight and nomads fight all the time. So if farmers go out and fight nomads, do you know what nomads do? They laugh. <laughs> Thank you for coming out here so we could kill you. And then they're going to take their food. Like farmers can't fight nomads. Did you ever watch the Seven Samurai or Magnificent Seven? Like, or, or a bug's life, like they're farmers. They don't fight the bandits. They have to go get their own bandits, the Magnificent Seven or the Seven Samurai to protect them from the bandits. Like the farmers farm, man. They don't fight. When farmers fight nomads, farmers die. And that's going to be very important to development of cities. You don't fight. There are no armies that go off marching on, nah, 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 they get killed. Nope. You do it once and you realize, nope. Farmers farm. They don't fight. These guys lose their military skills. They used to be nomads, which meant they fought all the time. Maybe they even had horses, but they're now in river valleys. So they lose their horse breeding skills because it's, bad, it's a bad area for horses. And these horses are not good for draft animals. They're not that big. The, the ponies of the Central Asia that could carry a person were not strong enough to plow land, to plow the mud of the lower Euphrates. So now you have an extra mouth to feed this giant ho this horse, and what happens is you don't need them. So when they die, they die out, and you lose over a century, you lose the ability to breed those horses. So settled people don't have horses. They also don't have military skills because they're farmers. They don't train. They don't use their bows. They forget how to fight. And over a hundred years, they stop. All of those, all of what used to be built into them is now atrophied. It's gone. Second is physical labor now matters. Farming mud in the southern Euphrates and the lower Euphrates is literally back breaking labor the strength of your back the strength of your legs your physical endurance equals survival equals food equals wealth equals survival which changes gender dynamics men win Men are stronger than women. I'm sorry, ladies. It's just biologically true. I didn't say men are better than women. I said men are stronger than women. This is what testosterone does to a man's body. Testosterone makes the tinsel strength of their muscles twice as strong as a woman's. It just is. I'm sorry. It's just true. And this becomes the justification. Women simply cannot do as much physical labor farming as men can do 
which means women lose their economic importance in this society. Literally, the best thing to ever happen to humans, agriculture, is the worst thing to ever happen to women because women will lose their rights. They will lose their economic importance, which means they lose their rights. They lose their independence that they had in nomadic societies. They lose that and they've been clawing it back ever since. You, ladies, you were in college. Why? So that you gain economic independence. You are become economically valuable so that you can get a job and you turn that economic value into social political value. So that you marry somebody of the same economic status of you who will respect you and who will value your economic output, who will support you, who will be a partner to you. But they only respect that because you're able to do that. Which is what nomads had 10,000 years ago. Women have been clawing back those rights ever since. It's taken them 10,000 years to do so. So women lose and men gain. But not all men gain because we're also going to get a hierarchy of wealth. So elite men gain, those who have more land, those who can hire more laborers, those who, who um, through luck, because the floods don't hurt their land when it hurts other people's lands, or guile, or they happen to have uh, their children, they happen to have a few that live rather than a lot who live, which means you'd have to divide up your wealth when you die among more kids, or no kids who live, very few kids who live, which means your wealth has to go to someone outside the family if you don't have any kids who survive uh, into adulthood. So too many kids is bad, too few kids is bad. Um, and so that's all luck, man. Measles, your kids dying of measles is a roll of the dice. Your wife dying in childbirth, marrying the right woman is both luck, skill, and being in the right place at the right time, knowing the right people being connected to the right families, being born into the right families. Men gain from this. It's backbreaking labor, just like the Genesis says when, when Adam leaves e, uh, Eden, it is you're going to labor and it's going to suck. But men gain socially and politically and women lose because they become economically less important to the survival of the group. Three, you need nature to work for you. These are people who need the rain to rain, but not too much. The sun to shine, but not too much. The river to flood, but not too much. If it does anything, not too much or not at all. If the sun doesn't shine, you're screwed. If the sun shines too much, you have a drought. If it doesn't rain, you're screwed. If it rains too much, you have a flood, you're screwed. It's like... You need nature to work for you. And you have no control over that. You can't make the river flood. You can't make the clouds rain. You can't make the sun shine. You have no control over the things you need. Nomads don't care about weather. It's hot. We move to someplace that's not hot. It's cold. We move to someplace warmer. We'll find food. We follow the animals. The animals are like, dude, I ain't staying here. It's too hot. I'm moving. Nomads don't. Nomads have to live with nature. They have to understand nature. Whereas settled people are reliant on nature. They need nature to work for them. If nature doesn't work for them, they're screwed. They're dead. And finally, you need protection from neighbors. Now you're going, now you're living in a place. I have a little house and I have a neighbor. I have a neighbor on my other side. I got a neighbor down the street. You have the poor versus the poor. That guy next door, he's looking at my TV. I see him. You get the rich versus the poor. Rich people are always trying to exploit the poor. The poor people are trying to steal from other poor people because that's who they live around. Rich people are trying to exploit the poor. 
Hey, you have no money. How about you come and work for me for like two bucks an hour? You're like, oh, that's wrong. Well, guess how come your lettuce costs $2 a head? Because immigrants come across the Mexican border, work in Arizona, New Mexico, and especially California for nothing. For pennies on the dollar, for $4 an hour. And then they, they maybe go back over the border or maybe not. And they do a job Americans simply won't do. There was a program. There's a program right now. I'm sure it's still in existence called like Take Our Jobs. Um, Stephen Colbert participated in it. And it was from the Fruit Pickers Union. And it was this idea, the, the Cesar Chavez group. And it was, we will hire any American any citizen, any American citizen who wants to be a fruit picker, who wants to pick strawberries, pick cotton, pick lettuce, anyone. When Stephen Colbert did it, in the first year it was, or second year it was in existence, you know how many Americans did it? Four. Not 400. Not 4 million. Four. They could have a job tomorrow picking food they didn't want to do it because the job is hard it doesn't pay it sucks americans simply don't want to do that job so but the company that owns the farm is making a hell of a lot of money because they get to pay the workers almost nothing no social security no medicare no nothing nothing So they pay payroll tax. Okay. But they're paying it on nothing. And there's plenty of unscrupulous people who totally don't even do it all off the books and pay them in cash or pay them in barter. Don't pay them in anything or enslave these people. This is, this happens in Australia where, um, you can literally hire yourself out. If you're a backpacker, you can get a three month visa extension or a 90 day extension on your visa if you work on a farm. And there's all kinds of stories of rapes and murders because you're out on a farm in Western Australia or Northern Australia or in Northern Territories. You're in the middle of nowhere. I mean, you are in a town of 500 people and there's nothing for a thousand kilometers. You know, take a look at, at the Northern Territory, take a look at where Broome is on the map. There's nothing out there. Just nothing. Nothing south. If you could go a thousand miles to the south and there's nothing. And so these college people are like, hey, man, it's cool. I'm going to go a backpack across the outback. I'm going to be cool. And so to get the extension, you got to hire yourself to a farm. And the farmers are like, yeah, I got all these European and American kids coming. They're all 20 years old. Some of them are women and hot. And I'm going to rape them. And I'm going to enslave them. And nobody's going to ask questions because I'm out in the middle of nowhere. There's no Wi-Fi. There's no cell phones. There's nothing. You're in the middle of nowhere. And so this kind of working slavery happens all the time. The fishing boats do it. There's a big thing with Costco. Buys a shrimp. And some of the shrimp it buys is from Thailand and Indonesia and the Philippines. And they use slave labor. This happens in the Middle East where they put out au pair and nannies and the women show up to be an au pair or a nanny. This happens in Russia and it's happening in China now where the women show up, poor women show up and these wealthy guys say, give me your passport and they hand over the passport. And they're like, okay, you're a slave now. You can't leave and now you're a prostitute. And they're like, uh, that's not what I signed up for. And they're like, yeah, well, it's going to happen whether you like it or not. And my three guys here are going to beat you senseless. And who are you going to call? I've got your cell phone. Or you didn't even have a cell phone because you're poor. And I've got your passport. So guess what? Now you're a sex slave in the underground sex market. And there's something like what? 300,000 sex slaves in America right now? So the rich are always exploiting the poor. 
always exploiting the poor. You can make the argument that capitalism is an entire system based to exploit the poor. So only communism will, will argue that. There's also the poor versus the rich, and this is an important part. The rich people are always afraid that the poor people, there's more poor people than there are rich people, a lot more poor people. There's 98% of the people are poor and only 2% are rich, and so they're always worried that the poor people are just going to murder them in their sleep. You want to know the thing that scares a slave master in the South, in the American South in 1820 more than anything else? The butcher on his farm. His cook. Why? Why does his, his slave, his black West African or now African American slave in 1824 scare him? Why? Because we have to eat meat because we are civilized people. But I ain't going to cook it because I'm a slave master. I got slaves to cook for me. But that slave needs to have a cleaver, a chef's knife, a 10-inch chef's knife. And those knives, they got to be sharp. You're going to butcher a pig? It got to be sharp. And I got to go to bed at some point. I'm on a farm with 20 slaves. And there's me. And I got to go to sleep. What's stopping them from just murdering me? And so the slave revolt will scare Spartans, will scare the American South, will scare all slaveholders. The idea, all the way back to pre-Babylon, rich people are always scared of poor people. That they're going to one day get it in their heads to murder them. Because there's nothing, and I mean nothing, to stop poor people from murdering rich people. Rich people don't have the numbers. There's not enough of them. Remember, there used to be the Wall Street protests and it was the 99%. Like, the 1% can't stop. The 99% from killing them, taking their money out of the banks, and just changing the entire system. Like, there's nothing you can do. You don't have the numbers. So the, the rich people are terrified of poor people. And that's important because it means whenever they set up systems, governmental systems, economic systems, religious systems, they always have to respect that fact. There's always a fear in these systems of how do we exploit the poor, but not too much. Because if we do it too much, they will murder us. And then I don't get to be rich. The worst thing that happens for a rich person is dying. Because then you can't use your money anymore. You're dead. So being murdered by a bunch of poor people in the French Revolution is bad. It's not a surprise that the Marquis de Lafayette and other really rich guys who are going to survive the revolution become leaders of the revolution by getting up, by standing up and going, I'm rich. And they get booed, boo. And they go, no, because I'm giving it all away. I don't want to be rich. I want to be a man of the people. And they're like, woo, I'm giving my money to the people. I'm going to build libraries and I'm going to build trusts. And I'm going to build hospitals. And they're all go and they're going to be given to the state. They're going to be given to the people. Uh, no one will own them. And you go, woo. This is why the Metropolitan Museum of Art was free. For a hundred years, a bunch of really rich people in New York said, we are going to make one of the best museums in the world, and we're going to let all these dirty, ignorant, poor people in for nothing. This is why Carnegie builds libraries. Because he's like, if they knew how much money I had built on their labor, they would murder me in my sleep. Tomorrow. So it's poor versus the rich. And then there's the rich versus the super rich. Because even though you have rich, like the top 1% isn't the same. There's the top 1%. And then there's like the top 1% includes people who earn $250,000. Now, I know people who earn $250,000. I know people who earn more than $250,000. And they live in New York. They live in Washington, D.C. They live in L.A. and San Francisco. And they will tell you all the same thing. I don't make that much money. I'm middle class. And you're like, no, you're not middle class. You are by no definition middle class. You are in the top 1%. But they don't care about that argument. Why? Because they don't feel rich. Why? Because they are looking at their colleagues 
on Wall Street, in Silicon Valley, in Hollywood, in government, who are earning millions. And they're like, I'm earning 250000 This guy makes $12 million a year, $50 million a movie, sold a Silicon Valley company. I know a guy who sold three different companies for at least $10 million a company. I could have been a part of those companies, but I'm with you. Woo! Aren't you happy about that decision? But the, that doesn't matter. The idea is the guy who's in the top 1% looks at the top one-tenth of 1% and says, why can't I be that rich? So rich people look at the super rich people and are like, why can't I be like you? And the super rich people are like, whoa, dude, you got to earn it. And that's bullshit. Because super rich people don't earn their money. They inherit their money. They inherited their money in the ancient world. They inherit their money today. Thomas Piketty has a 700-page economics book that came out a couple years ago about that very thing. It pro you could just, just look at the graphs in it. There's like 100 and 200 graphs in it. And they just they, the, read the first chapter. And it's people inherit their wealth. The vast majority of people, like think of Bill Gates. You're like, Bill Gates made his own money. Yes, he did. And think of Bill Gates' kids and his grandkids and his great-grandkids, and their cousins, and their cousins' cousins. All of them are inheriting. The next hundred generations of Bill Gates are inheriting that wealth. Look at the kings of England. Look at the dukes and the duchesses. They're still living on money. The House of Lords, none of them made their own money. They're living on a thousand years of money that's still in circulation. So the rich are against the super rich. And the super rich hate the rich because the super rich are like, dude, I am the most successful in the world as far as I know. And you can shut up because you're not as good as me. So there's the poor versus the poor, the rich versus the poor, the poor versus the rich, and the rich versus the super rich. And they're all jealous of each other and they all want what each other has. So who are you going to call to fix this problem? to fix the war against nomads and other settled people, to fix these conflicts within your society, to help us protect ourselves from nature? Who are you going to call? Ghostbusters? No, not Ghostbusters. That's silly. <gasps> You're going to call something else, and we're going to start with that in our next lecture. Thank you.